This is Courage, the third Zoom word plays, usually at Proctor's in Schenectady, New York, but now on your screens. I'm Kate Dudding, one of the producers of Story Circle at Proctor's. Joe Doolittle, who'll be one of our tellers today, is the other producer. And Siri Allison is the producer of word plays in Salem, New York. So the three of us collaborated on the titles and support each other. But we're so glad that you came and joined us today. During the performance, I'd like all of you listeners to be muted. And uh, so that if your phone rings or dog barks or whatever, it won't disturb our teller. But at the end of every story, you may unmute yourself and applaud enthusiastically, or you can just either clap visually or, or this is the way deaf people clap. So however you want to express your appreciation, that will be great. Uh, and also Claire Nolan, who is our co-host and tech guru, will be on, on the alert to mute you if something strange happens and there's some extraneous noise. But so much for the housekeeping. Our topic today is stories of courage. Maya Angelou said, courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. So we'll be hearing stories today, personal stories, historical stories about courageous people. We'll be taping this performance and it will be available on our website, storycircleatproctors.org under word plays at Proctors in a few days. So let's get started. In order to sort of connect all the stories together, I asked all the tellers this same question. If your story was a song, what would it be? Our first teller is Sandy Schumann from Albany, New York. His story is titled, How New York State Got Its Western Border. But the song he chose was, Oh Canada which as Margaret French knows is, and many of you probably know also, is the national anthem of Canada. Sandy, please tell us more. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I wanna take you back to 1787. Now for those among you who recall eighth grade American history, you'll remember that that is the year that the Constitutional Convention was held. From May until mid-September, a room full of men in Philadelphia, working out the political boundaries of the states and the federal government, resulting in what we now refer to as the Constitution of the United States. While they were busy in Philadelphia all through that summer, four men were defining the physical boundary between the states of New York and Pennsylvania. Two men from Pennsylvania, two men from New York. The written agreement said that the border between New York and Pennsylvania would first follow the Delaware River until it reached the 42nd parallel of latitude and then a straight line following the 42nd all the way across until it intersected the shore of Lake Erie. Indeed, the folks in Pennsylvania wanted a substantial section of Lake Erie to be within their boundaries because that would be their connection to Great Lakes Commerce. So those men struggled all summer long 
it took not only the skill of surveyors and their state-of-the-art 18th century surveying equipment, it took courage because they had to make their way across the wilderness. If you look at a map even today, and you look at what lies on that 42nd parallel, you will see nothing. It's rocks and trees. So not only were they skilled in surveying, they were wilderness survival experts. And in those years dealing with panthers and rattlesnakes, it took courage. Have I said courage enough? I think maybe I can drop it after this. Courage. They couldn't finish the job that summer. It was too arduous. They had to come back the next summer. It's now 1788. And finally, they're able to make their way all the way across until the 42nd parallel hits the shoreline of Lake Erie. And to everyone's surprise, that left Pennsylvania with only four miles of Lake Erie shoreline and not even a substantial harbor in those four miles. This was unacceptable. Now, they could have tried to renegotiate, the Pennsylvania folk could have tried to renegotiate their border to the west with the state on their western border, which you might think is Ohio, but it's 1788, that's called Virginia. And settling that border nearly brought on a war, so they weren't gonna mess with it. They renegotiated the border with New York involving the federal government. And the idea was that instead of having that border go straight across along the 42nd parallel, at some point they would drop a line of longitude and square off that corner which is how New York State looks today. Well, where exactly should they drop that line of longitude? What they worked out over the next several months was a notion that the surveyors would go up into Canada and locate the western end of Lake Ontario. And where the lake ended at the western point, they would drop a line of longitude and that would become the corner defining the border of Western New York State. In fact, they specified the most westerly bent or inclination of Lake Ontario. I'm quoting the New York State Constitution. So the next summer, they got a late start because it took a long time to work this out. We're now at 1789. George Washington has just been inaugurated, the first president of the, of the United States that spring. And three men from New York, three men from Pennsylvania begin their journey on horseback, of course, to locate the most westerly bent or inclination of Lake Ontario. They arrive at Fort Niagara, Fort Niagara at the mouth of the Niagara River where it empties into Lake Ontario. And there the leader of the expedition, Andrew Ellicott, who'd been appointed Surveyor General of the United States by President Washington. Andrew Ellicott approaches the commander of, the, of Fort Niagara, the commander of the British garrison in Fort Niagara. Now, those of you who are paying close attention are wondering how is it that the commander of the British garrison at Fort Niagara, how he's in New York, this is the United States. Well, the, the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War stated that the boundary between Canada and New York would be defined by a line going down the middle of Lake Ontario. Everybody on the ground knew that what is now Western New York was British territory. The British and their allies, the Iroquois lived there. 
that was British territory. How could that now suddenly be in the United States? How could that be in New York? And so here it is, 1789, six years after the Treaty of Paris concluded the Revolutionary War and the British are still there. They are commanding the fort at the mouth of the Niagara River. And so Andrew Ellicott arrives and says to the commander, we're here for this expedition. You should be receiving instructions from your governor allowing us to come through. No, sir, you may not enter this country. You must, you must leave and with haste. Well, they've come a long way. They're on a schedule. It's late in the season. They're tired. Well, you know, perhaps Perhaps we could just conduct a scientific expedition to see the Great Falls on the Niagara River while, while you wait to receive your instructions from your governor. No, sir, you may not visit the falls. Too many people have seen the falls already. You must leave this country. Well, we're tired. We, we would be content to just wait and be confined to a small parcel of land while we wait for that letter to, no, sir, you may not, you must leave this country. Well, desperate, Andrew Ellicott pleads, we're tired, our horses are tired, could we stay for lunch? And he finally concedes, allows them to stay for lunch, and then has them escorted out of Western New York to the Genesee Valley, where they wait. They, they had not anticipated this expedition to take so long. They've run out of funds. Uh, they have to sell their horses. Finally, they receive word that the letter from Lord Dorchester has arrived and they may enter the country. They, they get canoes, they paddle their way across the sh along the shoreline of Lake Ontario. They enter Fort Niagara and they're permitted finally to enter Canada. And then they're on foot making their way with all their equipment to the city of Burlington at the western end of Lake Ontario. And they find the Bay of Burlington. Now the, the Bay of Burlington, here's a, a, you know, the western end of Lake Ontario. It's, it's triangular. There's a, a bar, a sand bar that blocks off the mouth of the bay and it it trails off to a triangle. The most westerly tip of the triangle is eight miles distant from that beach that separates the bay from the lake. There's a little channel so that boats can get through. Now, reasonably, the surveyors from Pennsylvania say, well, the most westerly bent or inclination of Lake Ontario is the bar that separates the bay from the, the rest of the lake. This is a big deal because from the, the other end of the bay to the bar is eight miles. And because Lake Erie lies at an angle, when you draw down those two lines of longitude, it's 11 miles of shoreline. And the men from Pennsylvania want those 11 miles of shoreline to be in Pennsylvania rather than in New York. And further, if you extend those lines down to the 42nd parallel, it's 150 square miles. So this is no piddling bit of real estate. Needless to say, our surveyors from New York say, no, the the most westerly bent or inclination of Lake Ontario is the western tip of the bay. All that land and shoreline belongs in New York. Well, back and forth, it's the, the Pennsylvanians versus the New Yorkers. Now, of course, if I were there, I would know how to resolve this conflict. I would, I would take out my cell phone and I'd call the home office and I'd explain the situation and and await their instructions. Well, it's 1789. They have to wait 150 years for the telephone to be invented. The telegraph is 50 years away. They don't even have the Pony Express. 
they're going to have to solve this conflict on their own, keeping in mind they're behind schedule, they're over budget, they're in hostile territory. How are they going to solve this conflict? So they had a drinking contest. <laughs> they had a drinking contest and we lost. And that's how New York State got its Western border. <laughs> fun, fun. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> I remember when I first heard that story and I realized you had a beginning, you had a middle, and you have a snap ending, <laughs> but a very good one. And now it makes me wonder about all the zigs and zags and all the maps across the country and all the negotiations and shenanigans and, and whatever, and all the courage, I gotta use that word, all the courage it took to, to, to solve all those problems. So thank you very much, Sandy. Our next teller is Beverly Schwartz from Latham, New York. Her story is called Believing in Miracles. When I asked her about what song her story reminds her of, she said, turn, 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 as sung by Simon and Garfunkel. Beverly, tell us some more, please. Good evening. It was the summer of 2017 and I was driving down my street and I noticed the family that had moved into my girlfriend's house was in their driveway. They had about five kids running around the front yard and they, they were just standing there, the parents. I got out of my car and I welcomed them to our community, introduced myself and we talked and he told me his name was Chris and this is his wife and he had five kids under 11. We talked, we exchanged numbers, and as I left, I turned and said, you know, I am looking for a walking partner. If you ever wanna take a walk, let me know. Believe it or not, a few weeks later, he called and said, hey, I just had dinner and I have a few, about a half an hour, you wanna take a walk? And that started our friendship. From 2017 to 2019, we walked. In the wintertime, not so much. But in the spring, summer, and fall, we took walks and built our walk up from one mile to four miles. Then one day we were walking and I said to him, this was the summer of 2019. I said, Chris, you have a cough that you've had for a while. Have you ever thought about checking it out? He goes, well, yeah, I, mean, I guess I'm getting close. I better check it out. It just doesn't seem to go away. He said, let me know what happens. A few weeks later, I was driving down my street and there was Chris in his pajamas in the middle of the day when he should have been working. And I was saying, uh-oh, what's wrong? He looked horrible. He looked like a ghost. Something had scared him or something. And I got out of my car and I said, Chris, what are you doing in the middle of the day here in pajamas? And he looked at me and he said, I did go to the doctor. I have lung cancer. <gasps> I said, I can't believe it. He goes, no, that's not the worst of it, Bev. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, they sent me to other specialists. They took some more tests, Bev. And I have stage four kidney cancer. The cancer in the lungs spread from the kidney area. Well, what are you going to do? He goes, well, I'm gonna have some more tests and start some more treatments and then decide what to do. We continued walking. He wasn't feeling good that day, but they encouraged him to get some exercise. So he would call me anytime he felt like walking. Then he told me that he had decided to go to New York City to get a second opinion because nobody up in the Albany area would operate on him. He was heading down to the city. Now, when I first saw him and he told me what he had, I said, you know, Chris, I believe in miracles. 
let's, I believe in praying for miracles. Would you like to believe and pray in miracles with me? He said, Bev, I already believe in miracles. So we're walking down the street and he's telling me about going to New York. And then he stopped. Just like in the driveway the first day he told me, he was the type of person that when he wanted to tell me something, he would stop talking think about exactly what he wanted to say, and then say it. So he stopped walking, stopped talking, and stared at me. So I stopped walking and stared at him. Bev, people have me dead and buried. I'm still alive. I'm alive, and I'm fighting for to stay alive. I have five kids. I have a happy life. I want to save my life. I am not dead and buried. So I took my water bottle. We always carried the water bottle wherever we were or wherever we were talking. We always had water bottles. And I said, well, then let's toast to you being alive. You're not dead, you're alive and let's toast to miracles and pray for miracles. And he took his bottle and we toasted miracles. And we walked down the street like a skip and a hop saying, we believe in miracles, we believe in miracles. I don't know if anybody on the street saw us, but they probably thought we were crazy. He went down to New York and had a surgery. And they went to a hotel afterwards for a couple of weeks to recover. And while he was in the hospital, and I mean, while he was in the hotel, he called me and he said, oh, it's over with, they did the surgery. It was exactly what you told me it might be like. And I asked good questions that you suggested to the doctor. And I'm really happy and I'll be home in a few weeks. Please pray for me. And I said, you know, I know you're Catholic and I'm Jewish though. And I know some good Jewish prayers. I'm going to say some good Jewish prayers to the Jewish God up there in heaven. And you can say some Catholic prayers. I know you have to go through the Pope to get to God. So at least we have two gods that are going to hear our message. And he just loved it. When he came home, though, he was very weak. He never really recovered the strength he had before the surgery. His wife was working. His kids were all in school or daycare. And he was sitting home alone. So I said, come on up as often as he felt comfortable. And we spent many hours on my deck talking and getting to know each other. He was living life as much as he could. And he was trying to have all the courage he could to fight this disease. Um, it, at that fall, right before Christmas time, it was last year. And I usually was bringing dinners or goodies for the kids. So I had some Christmas goodies. So I called and said, can I deliver them? He said, we'd love it. So I come in, put the goodies down and the kids all run and start grabbing food and running away eating and running and chasing each other. And he had the biggest smile. He enjoyed watching his children. I said, Chris, what are you doing tonight? Now, I thought I knew most of what he did and how who he was. And he said, well, every Thursday night I go downtown and I work for an organization I volunteer for and we go out and feed the homeless supper. We make sure if they need anything like a scarf or gloves or whatever, we try to get it for them and help them out. I was really impressed. Here he was fighting his own illness and still giving back to the community. Then Chris said, I also work for my church and I do some other volunteer work with community people in need. Then I said to him, well, what are you doing on Friday night? Well, he says, on Friday night, I used to love this band in college and they're playing in Boston. My friends got me tickets and I and my wife are gonna go listen to this band I absolutely love. Again, he was living his life to his fullness. And when he got back, they had put a special chair on the side of the stage because he needed to recline at that point and to sit and be comfortable. And they made accommodations for him and he got to talk to the band. And it was like a night of, he just simply enjoyed, he said. After Christmas, it became January and we were sitting in my living room. We had been talking. And of course, what does he do? He stops talking. I know he has something to say to me. So I sit there silently. 
Finally, he's looked at me and he said, Deb, you know, I might not make it. He was, he was facing his mortality. What do you say to a person that says something like that? Well, the only thing I could think of was, let's take our water bottles and pray and believe in miracles and hopefully we'll have a miracle here. And what did he do? He stood up, undid his lid from his water bottle and he started throwing his water at me. I wasn't going to take that. So I stood and started throwing my water at him. And we were laughing and giggling. And my, I was wet. He was at water all over the floor. But we both were smiling. Then the virus hit. Everything was closed down. We couldn't visit anymore. We could wave through his door or his bedroom window. We talked and we texted he told me in March that he was waiting for a new drug that was going to become a test drug and that they wanted him to try it. But it was closed down. They were waiting for permission from the state to have a trial. Eventually, in May, they opened it up. And he said, it opened up. All I have to do is give my saliva sample to see if I qualify for this test. It's the last drug that's possible for me. He sent the saliva in, and two weeks later, he called me. Bev, I didn't qualify for the test. The radiation I had in my lungs fried him, and I couldn't be accepted. I didn't know what he was going to say then. I mean, I, I just felt horrible, and I said, well, let's, you never know about miracles. There's going to be something good in your life that's going to be. And he said, yes, there is. He said, what? I bought a boat. A boat? What do you mean a boat? You bought a boat? Yeah, for only $10,000. It was a used boat. And I'm going to put it up in Lake George, put it in, and I'm going to take my family and my parents and rent a house, and we're going to spend the whole month of July up there having fun. And I'm going to have the vacation of a lifetime that my family will always remember that what we did. Wow. He really knew how to live. And he was also still helping his family also get through this with him. He lasted to the third week of July and then unfortunately got sick and had to be put in the hospital. He was in and out of the hospital till September. He would call me, he would text me, and we would talk. Then I was driving down like a deja vu down my street. And his front porch had a covering where there was chairs. And on the front porch, they had balloons and streamers and everything you can think of that the kids made. And it said, welcome home. I knew he was coming home. But he's been coming and going for the last year and a half. This was a special coming home. And I knew why. Because he was never going back to the hospital again. Two days later, I saw on the internet the picture of him and his wife and kids underneath the welcome home sign. And everyone had the biggest smile that he had been given a t-shirt. And the t-shirt read, husband, daddy, protector, hero. And he was my hero. And he was all their heroes. About a week or so later, he texted me. He said, I'm too weak to do anything now. I can't get out of bed. He was very frustrated. And he said, Deb, please pray for me. And then he would always write miracles. I reminded him that I would definitely pray for him, especially to the Jewish God, because I know he's going through the Catholic one. He laughed. A few days later, I got another text. I could hardly read it. I passed the house and saw a minister coming and going. And I saw a person and I said, the house, Chris, and he goes, well, we don't know we're hospice. We're coming here for the first time. So I knew it was near the end. Last text he wrote me was miracles. We went to the wake. I, I went to the wake early because of the virus, and I decided I could go in and out. I got there, and there's a long line. There was social distancing. No one was near each other. And I went in and in the corner was a video of his life and all the pictures and I simply enjoyed it. 
it took me about 20 minutes and I turned around and I saw his wife had been looking at me. Well, what do you say? So I walked up to his wife. And she said to me, Mav, how are you doing? No, I'm saying to myself, you don't have to ask me. I'm here to, for you. And she said, Bev, how are you doing? And all I could do is kind of like start crying. And she reached over and she gave me a hug. She had realized that our relationship, our friendship, that Chris and I had, and she was appreciating what I and Chris did for him, her, and her family. Now, I look at it as Chris lived his life to his fullest during his illness. He died at 43 years old. He gave back to people in need during his need of time as well. And he never gave up fighting. I feel that the relationship and the friendship that Chris and I developed will follow me for the rest of my life. He is my hero. And we both believed in miracles and we got the miracle of friendship that will be with me forever. I would like to now toast my friend Chris with my water bottle because he was my hero and he lived a life well lived. L'chaim. 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 Thank you, Bev. Thank you for sharing your story about courageous Chris. Um, I know it touched my heart. Thank you. And I miss him very much. And I found a new walking partner. Two doors up, another uh, neighbor is now becoming a walking partner. Okay. Very good. Uh, hope that story ends differently. I thought of that, but I didn't <laughs> want to take it. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't take that wrong. No. Oh, no. well. <laughs> he right Thanks. Now, yeah, he's young and healthy right now. Oh, good. <laughs> and he has three boys that are helping me in my yard, so he's always here with them. So I'm really developing a nice relationship with their family. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Beth. You're welcome. Well, our next story is an historical story from South Africa. Our teller is Claire Beetlestone. The title of the story is The Last Stand of a True Warrior. When I asked Claire Beetlestone what song uh, she related to this uh, story, she said, The Partisan as written and sung by Leonard Cohen. Claire, please tell us more. There. Yes, that was straight at a la after La Résistance in World War II. I think I've misnamed this story. See, the Bushman of South Africa was never a warrior. He is a very peace-loving person. In fact, not a warrior at all. I don't think any human being goes to war, really, unless something absolutely terrible happens forcing them to. People are peaceable, basically. Now, let me start the story by saying, I call this group of people the Bushmen. There are many, many names for them, most of them slightly pejorative, but I'll use this name because that was the historical name of these people. They have been on earth 42,000 years before the common era. They were the first human beings. Their genes are found all over the world in Africa, Asia, Europe, and America. 
at one time they were the most people in the world. Time went on and some of their number went to various places. And then the ice age came. Now the Bushmen in Africa was very, very well situated. There were rolling grasslands. There was lots of game. There are lots of green and growing things. And there was a copious amount of water. The people who had gone north didn't do so well. But as time went on, as the ice started to melt, they who had developed new skills and developed new tools began to thrive. It was warm, they had more food, they had more game. Their children began to live longer and they had more children and those children had even more children and they found they needed more hunting ground. And then they found they needed more prairie for cattle raising. And then they found they needed more farmland. So gradually they had to move, they had to migrate and they migrated all over the world, some of them down to Africa. They came from the east, they came from the west and they came straight down the middle of Africa all of the time encroaching upon the territory of the Bushmen. This was gradual, but gradually things began to happen. Now, the Bushmen are hunter-gatherers. They live a very simple life and a hunter-gatherer life might be simple, but it's very busy because every waking moment is devoted to gathering food. And as you trek through the desert with them, you'll find them looking here and there for something to eat. And he'll take his bow and arrows, which he always has, and there's a rabbit passing by quickly as a flash. He'll shoot it and make a fire there and eat it. Or he might take it back to the place where he's staying. Once a long time ago, I was trekking through the bush with a companion. It was hot and uh, we were very thirsty. All of a sudden she pointed to a little stick, a little tiny stick, one, one inch long and said, take your digging stick and we will dig there. And we dug and we dug and we dug. We dug for a long time in that heat. And finally, when we unearthed a tuber that stretched from my finger to my shoulder, it was so deep. She asked me to lend her my knife, cut a little piece off after brushing it off with her hand and gave it to me to eat. It was full of water. She says, this is one of the water sources in the desert. You must learn to recognize this. The Bushman is a very, very welcoming person. In fact, when people run away from any conflict, they will give him succor. They will keep him until he can go on his way or until he wishes to join them. They are very gentle people. They are kind and they are small. They're very diminutive, but beautifully, gracefully constructed in the way they move. And they are consummate hunters. First of all, they understand their prey very well. They understand their habits and their mindset. Also, they will track game over solid rock. And if they wound an animal, they will follow him down until he falls. And they can run up to three days without food, without water in the desert and without rest. They're tireless. But at his leisure, which is very sparse, he is an absolute delight. He loves laughing, he loves laughter and will make jokes whenever he can. Now, 
as time went on, more and more people moved into his area and he became pushed into the less accessible, the less useful land. This happened gradually over the centuries, but by the 1600s, the Boers came, the Trek Boers from Northern Europe. They came, you know, the tall men with ample bellies, fecund wives, lots of firearms and wagons. They came and they came to stay. They came really with a very self-righteous attitude. They felt that they, God had designated them to be the masters of the land. They believed that they had to tame the natives. They believed that they were designated to make the land flourish. They were so full of themselves that they didn't see the Bushmen. You see, to the Boers, property was everything. Now the Bushmen owned nothing, therefore they owed him nothing. In fact, they didn't even see him. Well, gradually, they killed off his wild stock. They despoiled his lands. They chased all the bees away and when they swarmed, they scattered them and they took over their water holes. Those people had been hunting there for eons since the beginning of time. Their water holes had been given to them by their ancestors for centuries. The Boers came and displaced them and took away every means they had for survival. They never noticed the little Bushmen. Well, the Bushmen kept on hunting, but they had to hunt the cattle of the Boers. The Boers did not like this very much. And what they did was to kill anyone who took their cattle. And soon there was open warfare between the two. They would go hunting and lure the Bushman out and kill him. More and more parties would go out to find them. There were bounties on their heads and any time a Bushman was seen, he was shot. They even hunted him as you would hunt a wild animal, taking their dogs and horses and chasing them down. One commando com bragged that he had slit the throats of 200 Bushmen in one raid. Little by little, the Bushmen had to be in pockets throughout the land of South Africa. He was mainly in the desert regions. Now, his end came, or one of the ends came, when he was in the, the Mountains of Mercy. The Bushman was on a high area. His people were sheltered in a cave. A Boer commando was surrounding him. There was fighting and there was bloodshed and bodies were falling into the rocks over the precipice. And then the Boers sent a boy to parley with him. She knew their language because his nursemaid had had that language. His nursemaid was a Bush person. And he pleaded with them and pleaded with them, please, he said, your lives will be spared, but please do not fight. The Bushman leader said, I will fight. I will fight till the end. Go tell your leader that. Go, go away, go be gone. But the boy pleaded and pleaded, tearful. He said, please, your life will be spared. I will even walk out in front of you. So no stray bullet will hit you, please. And the Bushman, very annoyed that his his um, 
plead had been rejected. Said, go, get away from me. Tell him that I will not, I will not surrender. As long as I have life and as long as I have a quiver full of arrows, I will not surrender. Go tell him, go, go, go away, go away and now be gone. So we have Stone Age arrows against muskets, front loaders, very well crafted. Those arrows are tipped with a poison that when it gets into the flesh causes intense pain. The pain is so much that the victim will tear and cut at his own flesh through blood vessels bleeding to death or eventually dying of some overwhelming infection. The front loaders, the guns of the boars were very nicely crafted and they had many. So the fight went on and the Bushmen turned again to fight. Bushmen lay in piles on the ledge. Some of them in their death throes fell over the edge and were shattered in the rocks below. And they kept on fighting valiantly, but finally the moment came when only the leader stood and he went to the edge of the precipice and his arrows flew faster than speed and with great accuracy. But again, the moment came when he was left with only one arrow against his bow. At one point, someone called out, surrender and we will spare your life. And he took his last arrow, shot it at the man who spoke and said, I will never surrender. As long as I am alive, I will not surrender to anyone who has despoiled my people. And with that, he turned and jumped off the edge of the precipice into the rocks below shattering his life. Courage. Thank you, Claire. Whoa. <laughs> ah. Thank you for sharing all that historical information about people I had never even known of. Uh. I'll tell you more and more if you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you could, but maybe not right now. <laughs> okay, our last teller for the first half of our program is Eileen Mack, also from Latham, New York. Her story is called Courage of Their Convictions, a story of the Bishnoi people, an historical story from India. When I asked Eileen, is there a song that reminds you of this story? She said, make me a channel of your peace. Eileen, please Hi, tell thank us. Thank you, Kate. Um, I just want to address Claire's story. I recently saw a movie called The Octopus Teacher. And the man who, um, who made the documentary and made friends with his octopus uh, was actually inspired by trackers from, from Africa. And I'm wondering if it could have been the, the Bush people. I'll have to go back and watch the beginning of it again so I can give a better appreciation. Well, my story isn't <laughs> all that cheery um, either. And I was thinking about courage and courage actually happens many, in many ways throughout our lives without having to be anything big and huge dramatic. It's our kids uh, trying to do Zoom calls. It's um, like in Beverly's story, the, the wife was courageous, Beverly was courageous and her friend Chris was courageous. 
So I think if we kept our eyes peeled, we'd, we'd find there's a lot more courage happening out there. Um, we just had an election and whether you were the winner or the loser, it takes a lot of courage to run for office. I know because my dad did all throughout my childhood and he never won, but he was his way of reminding the majority party that it was at least a two party system. But my story begins this way. She put her two hands out against the tree trunk. Her fingers opened and her arms slid around the tree in an embrace. And the tree held her and she held the tree. Her breathing started to slow and soften. Her aching shoulders softened. Her mind was at peace and the shouting of the men in the background and the braying of the camels and the, the stifled cries of her village people all disappeared as she became one with the tree. This was her tree. It, the year was 1730 and our dear woman at the tree, Amrita Devi, was not aware that in 1730 a 10 year old Mozart was composing and playing marvelous music. She was completely unaware that there was a place called North America where Ben Franklin was uh, establishing the first library in Philadelphia. She was living in the northern central part of India in the section of Jodhpur. She was a member of the Bishnoi sect, Bishnoi sect. Now Bishnoi is a word that comes from Bish meaning 20 and Noi meaning nine. The Bishnoi people lived by 29 tenants that guided how they led their lives and lived in this world. Some of the tenets were things like, you need to wash every morning. Amrita, Amrita, Amrita was introduced to this world by her mother. As soon as her mother could get up from her childbirth bed, she took her baby darling out to the forest. The Kajarli trees were there. And she took her baby and held her horizontally so she could, baby could look up to the branches. Look up, Amrita, look up at the branches shading you from the sky from this hot sun. And she held her vertically so she could look at the trunk. Look at the trunk. Oh, right there. You see that tiny, tiny creature coming up that tree? That insect. That is as valuable to our lives as you are to me. And look at the roots. The roots go down deep. And the roots help us because they hold the earth in place for us. When the snow melts off the giant Himalaya mountains, we are not washed away. When the winds rush across the desert and run brush through the world from the Himalaya mountains, the trees are a windbreak. And the leaves, the leaves, baby Amrita, they are food and fodder for the camels and the cattle. And the fruit, oh, when you get older, you can taste the fruit. Well, Amrita grew up in the Bishnoi community, living this life in which all nature was equal. If you think of like how American Indians, you've heard that they say the bears are their brothers. Everything was the brother and the sister. And she saw this in her community. If there was an orphaned antelope, a young mother might nurse the baby antelope alongside her human baby. If there was a bird with a broken wing, they would take care of it. And when they went out to the cut a green living tree, you never harmed anything that was living. And when you brought the dead wood home, you went through the dead wood to look for insects that you would free 
so they wouldn't burn in the fire. And to minimize the amount of wood they used, they collected the, the dung from the animals and dried it and used that for fuel. But it was a life of joy too, because they loved to sing and dance. And Amrita had been given a gift when her mother took her to that tree. The gift was that tree. And the tree was her gift. She would go to the tree when she was sad and talk about how she'd been hurt and how mad she got. But one of the tenets of the Bishnoi is that you carry no malice and you must learn to forgive. And as she talked through these events with her tree, she found paths to forgiveness. She found paths to peace. <laughs> we all know how difficult that can be. This is the life the Bishnoi people live. So uh, as Amitra grew up, Amrita, I'm saying it wrong, um, she too became a mother. And there in the village of Kajarli, near the forest of Kajarli trees, she raised her three daughters. And they too learned the tenets of Bishnoi. Asu loved to climb the trees. Rodney, she was especially fond of the, the antelope, although she loved all living creatures as the Bishnoi learned to. And Bagu, well, it's hard to really know what she loved the best, but they filled one another's lives with joy. And they talked to their trees when they needed someone to listen, when they needed someone to hear a sad story or when they wanted to just be silly. They had their tree. So one Tuesday, not just any Tuesday, but Tuesday, September 10th in the year of 1730, the villagers noticed that out on the desert, there was a wisp of dust. And it wasn't the wind. And that wisp of dust grew larger and larger and larger until they could hear the hooves of the camels and see the men that were riding on their backs. And as these herd of camels with their fierce riders pulled up to the village, they looked down on the villagers and they told them what their orders were. We are here for the trees. The Maharaja of, Jod of Jodhpur needs the wood to build a new palace and fort. And he ordered his men to dismount and begin to cut the trees. Amrita Devi stepped up to the bold looking military man with his big mustache and his powerful sword. And she saw the men with the axes. But as a Bishnoi, she learned to be calm and cool and not to be afraid. And she told him he could not cut those trees. Killing those trees would be like killing her brothers and sisters and her mothers and fathers that the trees were sacred to them, as were all living things. <laughs> the man just started to laugh and he ordered the, the, uh, the soldiers to come across with their axes and begin chopping. Amrita went up, she put her hands out in front of her, her fingers spread apart. She wrapped her arms around the tree in an embrace and she leaned into the tree and the tree leaned into her. Her breathing slowed and the sounds of the braying camels and the angry voices of the soldiers and the men with the axes and the stifled cries of the village people and her daughters faded away. And as her body slumped to the ground, 
with that stroke of the axe. Her daughter Asu walked up to the tree and she put her arms around the tree. My life is no more better than the life of this tree. And she lost her life. Ratni went up to the tree and she wrapped her arms around the tree in defiance of the soldiers and her head was removed. Magu knew her duty. And she too gave her life for the tree. Well, word spread and more and more villagers came and they too stepped up and they gave their lives, not just old people, not just young people, because all life was precious and their lives as human beings were no more precious than the ant or the blade of grass or the antelope or the tree. That day, 363 people were beheaded in the name of a Maharaja wanting to build a palace. Well, eventually it stopped and word got back to the Maharaja about what was happening. He was actually horrified that this event had taken place. Had someone told him ahead of time about the Vishnoi, would he have understood? I don't know, maybe. But 363 dead people apparently got through to him. And from then on, he declared that no trees in that region could ever be cut. No animals could ever be hunted. And today, the Bishnoi people continue their conservation practices, their way of life. It's more than just saving trees and protecting insects. It's about how they live their life with the tenets of telling the truth, nonviolence, caring for one another and creating a peaceful world where everyone, everything lives together. And the Bishnoi people, there is a monument there in the village, a stone monument recalling that day in 1730, when one of the first major acts of conservation and environmentalism took place. So I always wondered if maybe Bill McKibben was inspired by the, bish, the word Bishnoi because it's a number word. Because when he started his environmental group, 350.org, he also gave it a number because 350 parts per million of uh, carbon dioxide is our goal. And right now this earth is experiencing 409 million parts, parts per million. So we have a long way to go. And if we look to the Bishnoi, we can see how to live it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. Uh, what a remarkable group of people. Uh, we still live. Yes, yes, indeed. I'm, I'm so glad that they still exist. Uh, thank you for sharing their lives and their uh, practices and with us. So now it's time for a quick intermission. We all probably need to get up and stretch a little bit. I've heard this referred to as Zoom, but. Um, <laughs> however, I did, before we break, I would like to uh, mention that if you would care to donate to us, the suggested price is $12 per person. However, we realize that many people have been financially impacted by the pandemic. So any donation that you can afford to give us will be gratefully received. And we thank all of those you, of you who have previously donated to us. This donation information is both in the chat and on the screen. 
and is on our website, storycircleatproctors.org. And you can click on word plays at Proctors. Just to let you know, this performance will be rebroadcast on Public Access TV, the uh, Arts and Ed channel run by Proctors. And it's also available on our website, storycircleatproctors.org under Word Plays at Proctors in several days. Also on our website at the top right of corner of every page, you'll see next shows. And there are two more shows still set to happen uh, that our organization is involved with in November. And you can click uh, to see if there are any other additional events in the area. So let's take about a four minute break and I'll run some uh, music during that time. Welcome back to our second half of our show. Our first teller in the second half is Fran Combsberger uh, from Tornado Alley in Oklahoma. And she'll be telling us a personal story about the panther and the lantern. Fran, did you have a chance to think of a song that related to this story? Oh, I think I texted you. Uh... Yes, um, the Oklahoma Hills where I was born. <laughs> well, tell us more, Fran, tell us more. Way down yonder on the, in the Indian nation, not very far from the reservation, in the Oklahoma Hills where I was born. My daddy's song. My daddy was from Osage County, Oklahoma. And I grew up in rural Oklahoma, north central Oklahoma one of eight children. Now imagine a small house with three bedrooms, eight kids, two parents, and not a lot of privacy. My father would, after dinner, sit out on that back porch and allow exactly one child an evening to sit next to him while he lit up his cigarette and had a quiet smoke, as many do after dinner. Well, it was my turn one evening and I leaned into my daddy's knees and I watched with fascination as he lit that match and held it up to the end of that pell-mell cigarette, a filter-free little tube of tobacco that he seemed to love. <laughs> and, and he sucked in that air and that, that red, red light lit up and I watched in fascination as a paper burned back and I love that first little smell. After that, <coughs> <laughs> but that little bit of start was an amazing experience. I shook my head and said, Daddy, tell me a story about when you were a kid. He puffed a little bit, and then he said, well, I was about your age, that being 10 years old, and it had been a rough, rough time with the crops that spring and summer. We didn't have a lot in, and there'd been a bit of a drought, and we didn't have a lot of good luck hunting that spring and summer either. Well, we couldn't hunt much because of all the crop work, but we really needed some meat. It had come about October, oh, mid-October maybe. The rains had begun, thank God for that. But it was kind of cold and damp, and my pa and I, we got our oil skins on, and we got our bedrolls and we went out hunting. Me being 10 years old, I was the oldest boy in the family and the logical one to go with my dad. And I've been shooting since I was six. You had to be able to take care of yourself and you had to be able to hunt. There was a big family to feed. And so off we went into Northeast Oklahoma, deeper into Osage country where we lived. We had a couple of good days. Well, if you count a bunch of rabbits. And then we got a couple of squirrels. Come the third day though, it was foggy and Misty got up in the morning. We wandered through and much as we tried, we'd only bagged one squirrel and one rabbit. 
And here it is, late afternoon. The sun starting to come on down and the rain starting to mist around us. It was getting a little chilly too. The winds are coming up. It was after all past mid-October. And we were in a really heavily wooded area up in the Osage Hills. Now, I don't know if you know it because these days it's not the truth, but back then it was full of Black Panthers. Why, there was more Black Panthers in those hills than there were house cats right here in Blackwell where we live now. They were everywhere and they lived up in those trees and they had no problem climbing up into those branches, waiting and jumping down on you either. And they had the scariest sound you ever heard, like a woman scream. Paul and I were walking along and he was saying, well, son, we're going to have to find a place to bunk. It's getting drizzly and getting too dang dark to fire when all of a sudden, wow! There weren't other people around. Paul, was that a yep? That sure enough was a panther. You get yourself close up to me now. It's getting on toward dark. If we don't find us a place soon and get a fire lit, they're going to be after us. Well, I can tell you my eyes were out on stalks. That <laughs> he was, I was beginning to shake a little bit. Earl, come on, keep up with me. You can't be affording to get apart now. And then, wow, wow, one on either side. Paul, Paul took his rifle and he pumped it and he went, bam, bam. Silence on either side. Keep moving, Earl, keep moving. We got to find us a place. An opening of some kind. We got to find shelter. We got to. <sighs> he was getting a little nervous himself. Well, we kept walking and it was another 10 minutes before we heard anything because <sighs> those gunshots were actually louder than them screams. And, and then, wow! It wasn't as close as before, but wow! It was coming from both sides and it sure was not a comfortable feeling. And the rain started coming down heavier and heavier and made it harder and harder to see. Well, maybe it'd make it harder for them too, but they were more used to being outside all the time. Earl, keep an eye out. We got to find us a place. Well, I was scanning around and holding on to his oil skin as tight as I could, kind of running to keep up with him. He had long legs. When, Dad, Dad, look, Paw, 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 over here, look, look. There's something through the clearing. There was something through the clearing and it looked like a big lump of, uh, uh, oh, thank God it was a, it was a broken down hunting cabin. It was, it was some kind of structure. So he said, Earl, we got a clearing, we got to make it across. Wow, wow, bam, bam, bam. A third one for good measure. We ran, well, no, I ran. He grabbed me by the collar and said, don't you run. That'll draw them. We're gonna walk straight. So they walked. We walked straight across that opening. Me shaking like my legs was gonna give any minute. And we made it up to that old tumble down porch. Now the roof was barely hanging on it, but there was a door that you could, well, we pushed it aside and it was kind of on one hinge and peeked in there. There's just enough light to see what made my heart fill with dread. There in front of me was a cabin filled with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cobwebs. Oh, I hated spiders! Oh, all my life I hated spiders. I was the last one in the house to ask you to be asked to squash one. No, 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 no. <laughs> Excuse me. But Pa said, I'm afraid you're going to have to do it, Earl. I'm going to watch that door and I want to take you to take this here stick. And he leaned in and he took what had been a table leg. He said, you take that and you wrap those cobwebs around it. And then see that? That was a fireplace over there. You dump it over there. And Paul, he looked around. Wow! 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 They were certainly coming toward that clearing, but they, they were still in the woods, thank God. And then, and then I finally got my creepy job done and threw that thing in the fireplace and said, Paul, come on in, let, let's get in here. And, and Paul, he, he took a candle out of his pack and he, he lit it and he stuck it to the floor so we could see something. And then, and then he took a table and he shoved it up against that door to hold it solid. And then, and then he found 
some furniture and he jammed it up across the window. And then the, uh, the front windows look like they might hold okay. Paul just put a few pieces of wood up against them. And, and then there was still broken furniture we could burn. So he started as a fire in that fireplace. Wow, 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 sounded real close around that cabin and Paul, bam, bam. And then there was silence. I was as nervous as I think I'd ever been. Spiders and panthers and rain, oh my. <laughs> it was too much of a night for me. Well, we took out the last bit of cold biscuit we had and we took out the last bit of jerky and we drank from our canteens and leaned into each other up again that fire. <clears throat> Pretty soon though, the cold long day took hold of me and I fell asleep right against my pa's lap. And then, and then, wow, wow. Pa said he heard it. I slept right through that. And he peeked out front and then he went, damn, Pa never cursed, but he did. Because there, there he could see through those woods, a lantern, a light, a person stuck with them panthers out there in that rain, in that woods, in that dark. Oh, he started muttering under his breath. I kind of woke up to hear my pa saying something he doesn't say in the house with Ma. And, <laughs> and he was pulling that table away from the door. And he, he pushed that door open and I said, what are you? He said, shh, there's somebody out there. And then, wow, wow, sounded. And Pa went, bam, bam, up into the, up into the air again. And the Panthers went, total silent, total silent. And Pa, he watched as this lantern swung back and forth and back and forth, coming closer and closer through the, through the wood till Pa thought he might be close enough to hear it. He yelled, hey, over here, over here. And he, he lit a match and waved in a minute. And he said, over here, where you hear the gun? Over here, hurry, I'll cover you. And that letter just swung back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, coming out of that wood and wow, landed again. And, and Paul went, bam. And he didn't like that sound landing on his ears. Not at all. And he wanted to save whoever that was of the lantern. God knows they didn't have much time with them panthers. And, and the rain started coming up a little harder. And Paul said, over here, over here, he's waving his arms and shouting real loud. And that lantern came right on out of the woods and right on halfway up through the clearing. And then, and then Paul had out a string of words I never heard before. And he jumped back and, and he slammed that door shut and put the table again. And I said, Paul, what about the lantern? What about the person? He said, hush, Earl, get yourself over by the fireplace. And you know what? My pa. He looked whiter than a cotton sheet hanging on a line on a sunny, windy day. Oh, my goodness. He spent the whole night sitting up with that rifle across his, across his knees. And I dozed in and out. And every time I opened my eye to look at him, he was looking around with that gun and his finger on the trigger. Say, what? Well, I must have dozed off because he shook me awake. Come on, early gray of dawn. And he said, Earl, come, let's go. Light's coming up. Let's see what's out there. Well, I, I, I thought it might have been a person, but anyway, we, we rolled up our bedrolls and we drank from our canteens because there wasn't much to be eaten. Well, I'd sneak back a little biscuit. <sighs> Had a bite. And then he opened that door and we went out on the porch. There's no sign of a panther and Stood there five minutes or so, didn't hear a thing. <clears throat> but oddly, not a hundred feet from that step, there was a lantern sitting right there on the ground, all, all sputtered out. And we went over to that lantern and Pa said, I want you to track. I want you to see whose steps you find and ain't yours and ain't mine. Well, I've been tracking since before I learned to shoot. So I went tracking. And I went back to those woods and zigzagged back and forth three or four times. But for the life of me, I could find nothing that wasn't me or Pa or a, a pin. Pa, there ain't nothing here to show a person. He nodded his head and he shuddered. He said, let's get going south of here. I think it's time we moved where we were. 
And you know, he made me walk right close to him till we got all the way out of those woods. And not one more time in my life did we ever hunt in that particular section of Osage County. And I said, Daddy, is that true? He said, near as I remember. And I'll be darned if I didn't once again ask him maybe a year later to tell me a story about when he was a kid. And he told me the very same one. So folks, that there is a panther and the lantern and the courage it took to get out of those woods. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fran. My pleasure. I scheduled you to start off the second half and I thought you'd start it off with not quite so big a bang as you gave us, but <laughs> <laughs> everybody's awake, I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Fran. Thank you. Next teller is Margaret French. She's also going to tell us a personal story. I don't think there are any Panthers in the, this one. The title is Empty Saddles. And the song that Margaret thought of in association with this story was called Frady Cat. So there's a cat, <laughs> different kind. Margaret, take it away. The song is Empty Saddles. And it's kind of hard coming after Fran. This story is not nearly as exciting, but I, a bit of a cold, I think, so please excuse me. Um, when I was a little girl, I was afraid of cats and dogs and chickens and cows and bugs. Anything that could bite a scratch, sting, or kick. I was afraid of water. I might drown. I was afraid of death. I was afraid of suffering, dying, and the afterlife, or the lack of a laugh afterlife. And I was especially afraid of people. Now, my, my family had no real patience for this. My mother was a, a, a tough, feisty woman and she deplored my lack of gumption. A friend of hers came to visit when I was little. I hid under the bed. Another friend, another time. And I, I sat solemn and silent and the woman said to my mother, well, can she talk? And my mother said, of course she can talk. She's four years old. She just won't, that's all. Well, things didn't change very much as I got older. When I was 11, we were living in Calgary. Now, Calgary is cowboy country. And my parents, my father was in the army. We had, we had moved there uh, be, because of that. And he had met, uh, they, they had met a couple named Irene and Slim. And Slim was from Oklahoma and he was a cowboy. And he had ridden bron bronco busting, horseback in rodeos and uh, calf roping. And when he came to Alberta, he, he had a lot of horses. He was working on a ranch, kept some of the horses near him. And some of the horses were on open range somewhere in Western Alberta or Eastern British Columbia. He wasn't exactly sure where his horses were. He sold a couple of his horses to my father. There was a big Palomino gelding named Sugarfoot and a little bay mare named Tallulah. <laughs> we called it 
uh, we called her Thule. And it, so it happened only my father and I ended up doing much writing. And I liked writing, but I was afraid of most everything about it. You know, I was, I was afraid, for example, of going into her stall because my father told me that I had to make sure that Thule heard me coming because otherwise she might get startled and kick me. So I was afraid of getting kicked by my horse. When I went in, I was afraid of, of uh, as I put on the saddle, took off the saddle, I was afraid that she would move suddenly to the left and squish me. And um, um, uh, of course, going out to ride, we lived in an army camp and the army had horses because they had military parades and that's, was in, that's where we kept our horses. And uh, we would ride through the camp, past the pastures. And then there was a long section where fields where the tanks came. And we rode in the trails that the tanks left getting out of the camp. Now my father explained to me that I had to be careful um, of explosives that might not have detonated because if we went off the trail, uh, we might step onto one. And we didn't get off the trail unless a tank was coming. <laughs> so if there was a tank coming, you really don't have much choice. It's, it's good to get out of the way. So we would ride our horses off the trail and I would worry about being blown to smithereens. Then past the tank trail and we got out of the army camp altogether. Then my father warned me to be careful about gopher holes. Now there are a whole lot of gophers in Alberta. And he explained that if my horse were to step in one of those holes, it could trip. And uh, so I worried about finding the gopher holes because I was pretty nearsighted and on top of the horse, it was a long way down to the, uh, to the gopher hole. And if I saw the gopher hole, how could I get my horse to move out of the way in time so it didn't get hurt? Well, it was a summer evening and we went out riding, you know, out of the stable, past the, through the camp, past the pastures, out past the, uh, the tank trails and into the countryside. And there was a nice dirt trail with choke cherry bushes and Saskatoon bushes on the sides. And my father suggested we race. Now, um, I was afraid to race, but I liked it, sort of. And uh, I was afraid of my father being upset because, as he put it, Margaret, you are gutless, which is kind of strong, but neither my father nor my mother tended to soften their language. So I, I, I didn't want to be thought gutless by my father either. So we were racing and he was ahead of me partly because his horse was faster than my horse and partly because he was more courageous than I was, but I was close behind. And we went around what my father called a yes man, which was a, a turn and a dip in the dirt trail. And as he went round the last ma'am, his horse Sugarfoot fell, falling partly on my father. And I was right behind. My Tuli and I had no way to get off the trail and no place to go. And in the next instant, before I could even figure out 
what was going on, Tuli jumped over the horse and over my father. Now, this jump was a first for both Tuli and I. <laughs> and I promptly fell off. But, you know, I was 11. You know, I, I was fine. But my father, he was not. Broke his collarbone, dislocated his shoulder. Uh, with great difficulty, he got back on his horse and we slowly went back. And by the time we got back to the stable, it was already dark and he was in a ton of pain. Got off the horse and with great difficulty, got to a stool near the tack room and he said, Margaret, you're gonna have to unsaddle the horses and, uh, and take them out to the pasture. Well, you know, being worried as always that I was going to get kicked or squished. I got the horses unsaddled. I took off their bridles, put on the halters. Then my father said, take them out together. Yeah. Together? Both horses at the same time? See, I, I did it. But I didn't want to do it because... I was a girl who was afraid of most everything. And those were big horses, especially my father's horse. And they were anxious to get to the pasture. So they were nudging me and pushing at me. And I thought, suppose, suppose I, I can't keep hold of them. Suppose they run away or suppose they uh, trample me. So I was genuinely and terribly afraid. You know, this, this, gutless girl with no gumption who was afraid of most everything. I was definitely afraid of leading those two horses to the pasture. And I, I got back to, to the stable and my father says, well, I can't, I, I can't drive home. I need you to walk to the provo, the military police, and ask them to, to pick us up and take us home. Well, the provo were at the, the gates to the, to the camp. And by then it was night, it was, it was dark. But you know, it was quiet and there was nobody around and there, was, there were street lights and I knew where the, I knew where the gates were. So for that particular thing, I was not afraid. So I walked to the, uh, to the Provo and I told them my father was hurt and they, they came and they picked him up and they took us home. And afterwards, my father said, uh, he says, I was so proud of Margaret. She was so brave. She walked at night to the, to the Provo and she got help. I wasn't afraid to walk to the, to the Provo. I was afraid of lots of other things, but just not that. So that didn't seem like courage to me. And I was very much afraid of taking the horses to the, to the pasture together, but I didn't tell him that. So that didn't seem particularly courage, courageous not to tell him the truth about it. So I did feel like a bit of a fraud. Although, you know, it was a bit of a treasure to think that my father in that moment thought I was brave. It was something I could hang on to uh, later on in my life. And I did learn, I think, a lesson or two. One was the lesson, I guess, that my parents were always teaching me that whether you feel brave or not, you do what has to be done. And fortunately, I think, since then, 
the most of the many, many fears I had as a kid have shriveled up. And quite a few of them have blown away. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I think someone said, courage is doing what you have to do, even if you don't want to do it. And <laughs> you certainly did that. That would cover a lot of territory. I was a fearful child. Well, I mean, falling off a horse, uh, the, the unexploded bombs in the getting out of the way of the tank, those, those were real concerns, Margaret, you know. Uh, not to mention, you know, and don't forget about the kittens, the puppies. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah. Things well. that flapped, things that squawked. <laughs> but you rode in the Calgary Stampede, didn't you? In the parade. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. afraid. Oh, well, yeah, there were no unexploded bombs or no gopher holes, right? <laughs> Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Thank you, Margaret. I am the next to the last teller. I will also, I'll be telling a personal story that has historical overtones. The song I thought of was We Shall Overcome. And my story is called A Journey Toward Understanding. Have you ever thought you understood something and then realized later you really hadn't understood it deeply at all? This is a story of one of my journeys toward understanding. When I first saw this, I thought, I understand what Black Lives Matters means. Yes. Now this sign was created back in 2012. It was created when the murderer of Trayvon Martin was acquitted. Trayvon, he was only a 17 year old boy walking back from a convenience store after getting some snacks. But a neighborhood watch guy thought he looked suspicious and started following Trayvon. And then a fight broke out and the neighborhood watch guy pulled out a gun and murdered Trayvon Martin. I knew that wasn't right. I knew that that was not right at all. And besides, I, I remembered Larry's story. Larry was one of the leaders of a diversity training workshop that I had taken 15 years earlier at the company where I worked. Larry was a black man and he shared this story that I've always remembered. I was on vacation in New Hampshire in one of those coastal towns. As I was going into a shop, a white woman came out and said, oh, I'll be right back. So I said, okay. And I went into the shop. But when I got in there, I looked around and I realized I was the only person in that shop. And that woman who had just left, she, had to be in charge of that shop. And she let me go into her shop all by myself. Whenever I go in a store in Schenectady, I am always followed. People assume I'm gonna steal something. I looked at Larry, I felt so badly for him. That's the kind of thing that can really grind away at your self-esteem. People always 
assuming the worst of you. Oh, I thought that that was a terrible burden he had. That he must have to gear himself up before he goes into every store and going, yeah, it's going to happen again. Doesn't matter what they think. I'm a good man. Oh. So when I saw the Black Lives Matter sign, I thought, yes, I understand what that means. Until I saw this video of Ariel Sky Williams and her father. They were part of a video of black parents explaining to their children what they should do when they encounter a police officer. Mr. Williams taught Ariel Skye to say this. My name is Ariel Skye Williams. I'm eight years old and I have nothing that can harm you. Oh, again, my heart broke. I mean, she's only eight years old and she has that burden to learn that. And her father has the burden to teach her that. When my son was eight years old, this is what I taught him. If you're lost, find a police officer and tell the officer your name, address, and phone number. The police officer will help you. But after I saw Ariel Sky Williams and her father, I thought, now I really understand what Black Lives Matters means. Until this summer, when George Floyd was murdered in under nine minutes, tortured to death, really. There were many reactions to his murder protests, uh, people speaking out, and even two late, late night TV show hosts did something. The first video I saw was of Seth Meyers and what he had done after the murder of George Floyd. For four nights, he didn't start his show with his opening monologue, a tradition of late night TV shows. No, instead he had one of his writers, Amber Ruffin, tell about her life growing up and living in the United States. One of the things she told was, when I was a new driver, still in my teens, I was pulled over in a speed trap. The cop was coming at me furious, yelling things. And I thought, today is the day I'm going to die. That man is going to kill me. I was crying, I was bawling. I was 100% sure that he was going to drag me out of my car and beat me to death. Every black person I know has a few stories like that. Many have more than a few stories. Every day when black people leave their homes, they know that at any moment they can be murdered by the police. I thought, oh, they must feel they live in a land of snipers, the way soldiers in, in the, in, uh, war areas feel, feel. Snipers could be anywhere. Ah, oh. I thought how much courage it has to take every black person to leave their home. And we know they're not even safe in their own homes, but how much courage it takes every day. You know, when I was pulled over for a traffic violation near my home, do you know what my biggest worry was? I was hoping that nobody I knew would recognize me because it would be so embarrassing. 
if they saw me pulled over by the police because of a traffic violation. So then I thought, now, now I really understand what Black Lives Matters means. But I learned a little more from the James Corden show. He had a skit where it started out where he was angsting about white privilege that, oh, I feel so guilty about it, but you know, I don't even really know what it is. And, uh, and then one of his writers appeared on the screen, Olivia Harewood. And she said, James, it's, it's normal to feel a little guilty when you're talking about white privilege, but if it helps, it's not your fault. White privilege is something you inherited, not something you did wrong. White. Yes. Yep. It was such a beautiful story too. We got to hear the end. Kate, can you hear yeah. you know, Oh, here she is. We lost you for a minute there, Kate, but you're back now. White privilege isn't about how you were, uh, how you grew up or how you're living now. It's simply that your life isn't made more difficult because of the color of your skin. But you know, James, you can do something. You can use your white privilege to help fight for a more just society. Oh, okay. Now, now I really understand Black Lives Matters and, 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 and what, I, what I can do. Until I heard my friend Storyteller Sheila Arnold tell a story about her son and a confrontation he had with police. He was an adult at that time. It happened just a few years ago. And Sheila said that the confrontation could have turned violent, except that there was a stranger who was taping the confrontation between her son and the police officer. And when the mm -hmm. police officer saw that, he just turned away. Sheila ended her story by saying, I am so relieved that that stranger was a witness for my son. And now I have been a witness for my son. I ask you if you will be a witness for, for someone who needs someone to stand with them. Because frankly, I'm relieved that my son is not a statistic yet. It was that yet that really, really got me. That's what a burden she has and her, and her son has. I, I imagine that sometimes Sheila thinks, but that she always knows at a deep level. When her son leaves her home, she probably thinks this may be the last time I see him alive. Her son and my son are the same age and I have never had a thought anything remotely like that when my son leaves my home. So after seeing Sheila Arnold and hearing her story about her son, I thought now I really understand what Black Lives Matter means. Until I saw this photo. This was taken at one of the protests after George Floyd's murder. Look at him. He can't be more than four years old. And already he has the burden of declaring I matter. This is when I decided I will never understand what Black Lives Matters means. Oh, I'll understand more every time I 
see someone's photograph or listen to their story. But I will never understand it the way black people do because I have never had to carry all those horrible burdens they do every day of their lives. But I can do something. I can do what Olivia Harewood and Sheila Arnold ask. I can use my white privilege to be a witness for those who need someone to stand with them. Everyone's sons and daughters deserve to be safe. Thank you. Now, if you'd like to see the videos that I mentioned, they're all accessible from my website, www.katedotting.com slash BLM. And I just touched, I just touched on Sheila Arnold's story. She shared so many other things that I was completely unaware of. And of course, um, Amber Ruffin, spoke for four nights. So there's about 20 minutes of her. So, uh, Joe Doolittle, there you are. I, Joe Doolittle is going to end off our program with a story called Sharing the Passion of Your Heart. I think I have the story and the song in the right order this time, unlike I did for Margaret. Uh, because the story, the, the songs, uh, your wonderland, which we might see next week. Who knows with this weather? <laughs> thank, thank you all for uh, for uh, uh, just a, a super super uh, uh, experience. I, I, I'm I'm humbled to to try to come up with a story that's the equal to that, but. The title comes from one of the things I've learned about courage, and that's its root. In the uh, in the old French, cour, C-O-E-U-R, is heart, and rage is passion. So the passion of your heart is actually courage. And the extension of that into something in French called the plus participle, encourage, is while sharing the passions of my heart, which is to encourage. And I've thought about that in a lot of the things that I've done in, in my professional life. And the story I'm gonna tell you about courage and encourage starts in late September of 1775. And George Washington had just, uh, had soon in July, Washington arrived in Cambridge, Massachusetts to take charge of the Continental Army, of the Army of the New Republic it would become. And things were a little bit out of sync, but they had the British barricaded in Boston. And uh, what they didn't have was real order, uniforms. They lacked a lot, but they, they had passion for the idea of fighting the king and getting their rights. In September of 1775, Washington gets a letter from Philip Schuyler. Now, General Schuyler was in Albany and he's been renowned lately for owning slaves, but he was the deputy commander of the American army and he was a logistician. He understood a lot about getting things organized and done. And he realized that Washington's army needed cannon. So in the letter, he said, I believe I can get together a way of transporting the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga that we captured from the British to Cambridge. I can handle the logistics. I can get oxen, I can make sleds, but I don't have men that know about military things to really get them to Boston. So if you send somebody over, I can help you. Well, this was a challenge. It was 300 miles through mostly wilderness between Ticonderoga and Boston. And Washington was perplexed. He had just sent a contingent off to invade Canada. 
with some wonderful soldiers in it, but he didn't have those wonderful soldiers. And he looked at around his command room and his war council, and he brought up the idea of going through the wilderness. Cannons have to be in winter, sleds, anybody up for that? And one kind of, kind of bookish guy raised his hand and says, I think I can help you. And he says, Henry, how's that? Now he knew about Henry Knox. He knew that Henry knew a lot of things from books because he was a book binder and a bookstore owner in Boston. And he had become self-educated by reading a lot of books. And he was fascinated by military issues and history. So he actually had read a lot about canon. And other officers just didn't want to even think about this gentleman. So Henry Knox volunteered and he picked a hundred men. They arranged for two ships in Providence and they went to Providence, Rhode Island and they sailed to New York and they got all the way up the Hudson River on another boat and bingo, come the first week of December, they are in Lake George at Fort George and lo and behold, coming down Lake George in big bateaus were cannon from Ticonderoga. And all around on the beach were sleds made out of pine and oak that could carry tons of cannon. And milling around were 80 oxen. The logistics were all in place. The only thing that really wasn't in place was the weather, because there was no snow. But on Christmas, not only was it a winter wonderland, but it was a white Christmas. And they finally headed out four oxen on each sled, and they headed south. They spent New Year's Day partying in Albany. And again, the weather kind of confused them because they couldn't get the ice to freeze up enough. It wasn't cold enough. And finally, on the 4th of January, they were able to get the sleds across the Hudson and they headed off through the Berkshires. Now you may have seen the pictures was painted by an artist of the oxen coming through the woods and the cannon on the sleds behind them. It was cold. It was cold all day. It was marshy. You didn't know whether there were people gonna jump out of the trees at you. Now the journals of Henry Knox describe some of the parties when they had come to places where there were people but it was tedious work and it was really the whole encouragement of the idea that they were, they were fighting for that it pushed them and pulled them through the woods. And finally they got to Fitchburg, Massachusetts. And again, the weather confound them. There was no snow. So what did they do? They had People run and fill buckets and throw it on the roads and turn them into mud and slime. And they slid those sleds all the way to Cambridge, Massachusetts on the mud. And when they got to Cambridge, they were tired, but there were 6,000 guys that knew just what to do. And it was tedious work, but they got those cannon up on hills on two sides of Boston. And in the first week of March, they started to lob cannonballs into Boston. Okay. And they lobbed cannonballs into Boston for two days. And on the third day, the third day they got con guns on Dorchester Heights. They actually had over 50 cannon. So they had a lot of guns when they got them organized. And from Dorchester Heights, they could control the harbor. And the British decided they were gonna to have to take on those rebels and they organized a, a, a campaign to get the guns at Dorchester Heights secured or taken away from them. But lo and behold, the weather cooperated again. It snowed. So the British didn't mount that attack. And General Howe, who was the commander realized that the jig was up. And Washington got another letter. He got it from the, the loyalist in Boston saying that if the retreat from Boston was not, was not attacked, the British wouldn't burn the city. So the guns stood silent for three days while the British army 
and the people that were loyal to the king left Boston. And on the 17th of March, St. Patrick's Day, don't you know? <laughs> on the 17th of March, the American army entered Boston. And there wasn't fanfare because there was concern for smallpox. So they had to make sure that the elements of disease were not there. So it took them another week to make sure that they wouldn't get infected when they entered town. Now, I didn't talk so much about courage. And I haven't talked so much about encourage or use the words. But the element of both comes through the activity of the bravery of those 120 guys that went with Henry Knox that weren't afraid to, to take a walk in the woods in the winter for 300 miles towing a cannon. Wow. Or reading those cannons and putting them in place where they needed to be. Or all through the elements of the American history. And so one of the wonders of our history, of our experience as Americans, black or white, is that we have the wherewithal to share the passions of our hearts, to encourage each other, to be better than we think we can. And we learned it from people like Henry Knox, George Washington, and yes, even Philip Schuyler. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for rounding out this uh, afternoon and early evening of stories about people displaying courage. Uh, we've been uh, from prehistory to uh, recent days. We've been in uh, Latham. We've been in South Africa and India. We've been in Canada. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Can we have a final round of applause for the tellers? Oh, yes, a round well of applause. Everyone. That was great. Oh, was fabulous. Great. <laughs> and I just want to mention that uh, we have this, we're just in the middle of our season. We still have uh, four more events to happen after the new year. And the next one will be called priceless, a totally different topic.